At the end of this video, you will know exactly why we need generics in Rust and understand their tight coupling to traits. This will totally change the way you look at the language. Generics and traits are ubiquitous in Rust and you surely use them over and over, even in quite trivial code, maybe without noticing and understanding how they work. Today is the day this ends. We're pulling back the curtains on generics and see why traits are required to make generics work in the first place. This is the first episode of my advanced Rust series. Subscribe now if you want to level up your programming knowledge by learning concepts from the ground up, always focusing on the underlying principles first. This will give you a solid basis to build your career on. If you feel like you're still unsure about some of the essential Rust features, watch my fundamental series. I'd like to introduce generics by means of an analogy. So follow me on this example here. We have two arrays of i32 numbers, my nums and your nums. Our goal is to compute the sum of each array. A beginner Rust programmer might write the following code. Initiate the sum with the first element, then loop over the remaining indices and add the number at the respective index to the sum. Although the solution is not particularly beautiful, it is correct and does the job. The problem starts when the programmer copies the same code to compute the sum of the second array. Code duplication is often at the root of unmaintainable bug-ridden code and should be avoided in almost all scenarios. As a well-equipped Rust programmer who followed my fundamental series, you of course already know a way better solution to this problem. We need to factor out the algorithm into a function. In this case, the function sum of elements takes a slice of i32s and returns the sum as an i32. The algorithm remained exactly as it was. The function can then be called with both of the arrays and the code duplication is cleaned up. This is nothing new to you and I would have wasted your time if this example was over now. So let's take a step forward. A seemingly trivial expansion of our task comes in. We would also like to compute the sum of an array of i64 numbers. The algorithm for this will be the exact same, however, the REST compiler does not play nice with us. We are not allowed to call our function, that is set to operate on i32s with our array of i64s. Now, there surely must be a better solution than copying the function and adapting it to i64s. If there only was a concept to tell the Rust compiler that you want this function to work on any type, instead of only i32s. In fact, there is. And this concept is called generics. And lo and behold, the code we wrote out of pure despair is almost syntactically correct. At first, by convention, the generic type is oftentimes called T instead of any type. You could leave the any type though, if you really want it. And second, we need to tell the compiler that our T is now a placeholder for any type. Without this, Rust would complain that T is an unknown type and the program would not compile. We introduce the generic type T in angled brackets right after the function name. This makes sum of elements a generic function over the type T, and it can now be called for both i32s and i64s. And not only that, we can use this function to sum the elements of any array. I hope this introduction made it very clear that the main use of generics is to avoid code duplication, just like with functions. However, generics work on another level of abstraction. While functions allow us to use the same code for different data of the exact same type, generics allow us to use the same code for different data of various types. If you were eager to try out the code from the slideshow, you will probably already have caught that it doesn't compile. And this is not because our use of generics was wrong. Well, not the use of generics itself. The reason are two operators that are used inside the function. The assignment operator and the add and assign operator. Assigning nums at zero to our sum variable would either execute a copy for types that can be copied, or a move. While the copy is okay, the move is illegal here, because nums 
is an immutable reference that we cannot move out of. Because T could literally be any type, the compiler saves us from the illegal move out of an immutable reference by throwing an error. The second problem arises in the add and assign operator within the loop. We boldly assume that T has the ability to be added and assigned. This is not true for all types that exist. As an example, think of two vectors. They cannot be added even with a plus operator, and thus add and assign is also not possible with vectors. So are we back at square one? Do we need to duplicate our function for every type? Or can we somehow tell the compiler that this function is only meant for types that can be copied and add assigned? This is exactly where traits come in. Traits, or interfaces, as they are called in most other languages, are concepts that guarantee that an object or struct provides a certain functionality. In the past, the Rust compiler has often saved us by making quite good suggestions of what we would like to implement in our code to make it work. Let's see what it suggests this time. Here we can see that the Rust compiler says consider restricting the type of parameter t to std ops add assign. Well, let's do exactly this. How do we do this? We say that t colon, and now we can restrict the parameter by requiring it to have certain functionality. In this case, it is the std ops add assign trait. So we can see that one squiggly line went away from the plus equals, and two new squiggly lines appeared. At first, let's clarify why the squiggly line under plus equal disappeared. Well, we now say that we want t to be any type, but we restrict that it needs to have this add assign trait. And this add assign trait is the functionality that it must have the operator plus equal implemented for itself. This is what we call a trait, or as I said, an interface. So for all types t that this function can take, the compiler will make sure that the plus equal operator is defined for them. Let's see what else is wrong here. Here we can see in line 13 what the problem is. We cannot move out of type t, which is a non-copy slice. Of course, nums is a slice of type t. We just borrow this one, we don't have mutability, and especially we are not taking the full ownership of this, therefore we cannot move out of it. So there would be multiple solutions we could have here. We could, for example, call a dot clone here, which means we would explicitly clone the number. However, then not every type has clone implemented. The second possibility, and this is what we're gonna do for now, is that we want to copy. An implicit copy happens whenever this type on the right-hand side has implemented the copy trait. In this case, we need to make sure that the copy trait is implemented, and we do this by adding the copy trait as a requirement for our type T. So we'll say T must have both the add assign trait and the copy trait, which means that the add assign operator plus equals is implemented and a copy is also implemented. So now we saw that obviously traits are required to restrict generic parameters, in this case our t that was any type before, and now has to be add assignable and copyable. However, we didn't really see how a trait actually works and how we can implement one. And rather than doing that myself now, I would just like to look at one of the most important traits that we happen to use, which is copy. So if we look at the official documentation, we see that the copy trait is situated in the std marker module. We see that it is a public trait and its name is copy. And now let's just move through this together. So types that have copy are those whose values can be duplicated simply by copying the individual bits. And by default, variable bindings have move semantics. 
In other words, we can say that we define our own struct foo, and then we'll say x equals foo. That means that foo will be moved into x. And if we now do y equals x, x will be moved into y. And therefore, at this place, we could not use x again because it has been moved out of. Well, this is what we learned about ownership already. However, it says, if I type implements copy, it instead has copy mechanics. What are copy mechanics? That just means that instead of moving foo into x here, we will make a copy of foo. And x is now an exact copy of foo, but foo still exists. Same here for y. And because x has not been moved out of, but has only been copied, we can therefore still use this x after this assignment here. And we can see that we can derive this trait directly via copy, which means that the compiler will derive an implementation of the trait copy, which has a function that will bit by bit copy whatever our struct is. A side note here, clone is also required here to derive because it is a super trait of copy. However, we're not going into super traits in this video to not make things more complicated than they need to be. Just be aware that this is why clone is listed here as well. And now to finish up our first impression of traits, how would we implement a copy? How can we do this? The simplest way that we already saw is just to have a derive. However, if you have a more complex struct, for example, if you're using pointers in there or boxes as they are called at Rust, then deriving it directly might not be what you want. Also, let's say if there would be a file handle in there and you would like to have a special way this would be copied, you can implement copy and clone manually. And we see the syntax here. Our normal impl block would just be called impl my struct, and then we would put any functions in there that we would like to implement. If you would like to implement a trait for a struct, you just say impl, then name of the trait, for, and the name of your struct. This will automatically imply that you will have to implement all the functions that this trait defines. In this case, the clone trait only has one function, which is called clone, takes an immutable reference to self, and needs to return a self, basically, which in this case is the my struct. And in here, you can make an implementation that is as complex or trivial as you would like. Now, let me say one final word on how we call our sum of elements, generic in this case, over our normal sum of elements. Our sum of elements generic now has to decide which actual type will be replacing the T. In this case, the Rust compiler can infer that because we have only one parameter and this is an array of T, and in this case we will send in an array of I64, that T will be an I64. The Rust compiler will not be able to infer this type under any circumstances. Therefore, there's the possibility to explicitly provide the type as a developer. And you would do this by, after your name of the function, you would add colon colon and then angle brackets. And this is where you specify your type. In this case, it would be an I64. And you close the angled brackets. So in this case, adding this type here is purely optional. But it might be reasonable in some cases to do this. By the way, if you add the wrong type here, of course, the code will not compile because now it expects to get an array of i32s, but we provide an array of i64s. And to round this video up, I already said that we have been using generics all the time, maybe without knowing that. Why is that? Well, for example, look at a vector. If we use the macro vec to create this vector, it will automatically assume that those are i32s. And we see that here, the inlay hint says it's a vec of type i32, which means that vec is also a generic struct that has one type that we can choose. And in this case, the compiler decided to automatically infer that this is an i32. However, if we would say this is an f64, and we do this for everything, 
suddenly the compiler will decide that this is an F64 vector. And on top of that, we could explicitly specify the type here by just saying vec of, let's say this would be an i64, which would also be valid, and suddenly we have a vector of i64, all with the same syntax, all with the same struct, by means of generics. With this exemplary use of generics and traits, we merely scratch the surface of what is possible in Rust. Besides on functions, generics can be used with structs and enums, and traits really open the door towards polymorphism. There is so much more to learn that we will go over in the coming videos. Like and subscribe if you haven't done so already. I see you next time at Green Tea Coding.